Um, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sarah Pitt, who's a principal lecturer at the School of Applied Sciences at the University of Brighton, and who's going to discuss how quickly scientists have worked to develop laboratory tests for SARS-CoV-2 and the vaccines. Over to you, Sarah, thank you. Hello. So, <clears throat> I'm a biomedical scientist. I trained specialising in virology at uh, the Hammersmith Hospital a long time ago now and I've had a very interesting and varied career um, including working in a war zone but I don't think anything really prepares any of us for the last 12 months that we've had with Covid as virologists. So all of my career people have been saying there's going to be a pandemic and it's going to be bird flu from Southeast Asia. And so that's what everybody was expecting in 2009. And we had swine flu in South America. So grant you, it was a type of influenza, but it was a uh, pig, pig, pig or orientated um, virus and also came from the opposite side of the world. So everyone said, OK, that's fine. We've uh, we've thought about that. We've learned some lessons. And when the next one comes, we'll be ready. But of course, the pandemic that we're going through at the moment is not a type of influenza at all. And so that's why um, uh, viruses, virology is so interesting, because the viruses always keep you on your toes and there's always something new happening. So what we have is the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus. And um, the disease is caused by um, the uh, COVID, the disease is called COVID-19. Um, the we have uh, reached the very grim milestone of uh, three million people have sorry yeah three million people have died now of COVID around the world and um, if you're interested in sort of uh, seeing what's happening all around the world the Johns Hopkins University Corona Tracker is actually sort of collect, collates all the data and it's really interesting and, it, and it's really up to date. They, they update it daily. And the other really interesting source of information is the WHO, the World Health Organization website, which has information about research and vaccines and testing and again, up to date information about the whole, the way the pandemic's going. So I'd recommend those if you're interested in following up more information. I thought you might like to see what a coronavirus really looks like, because on the um, on the, the news and on all the media, you see these lovely stylized pictures where it's a really regular shape and it's um, bizarrely quite often pink for some reason. I'm not really quite sure why that is, but um, well, this is what this is what coronaviruses really look like. So this is the core part of the virus, which you actually that's the bit you see on the um television i think and but but this bit here is like a lipid envelope so coronaviruses all need their lipid envelope in order to function properly and these sticky out bits here are the uh, the spike protein so that's the thing that we're really interested in that's the bit that um links onto your cells and helps the virus to get inside the cell and cause disease and uh, which more of which later but you obviously you can't see this because this is um, an, a, mic a picture taken down an electron microscope remember viruses are too small to see by a light microscope and so you can't see anything but but in the top of this lipid um, is another protein called membrane protein and then Deep down inside the envelope, there's a thing called the envelope protein. And then associated with the core part of the virus here is a thing called the nuclear capsid protein. So those are all proteins that we're interested in in coronaviruses. So this is a stylized diagram, a map of the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome. It's my own diagram, it's not to scale, it's not complete. Um, it's, so don't hold me to any of this, but it was just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And so you'll see here that all the proteins I've just mentioned are at one end of the genetic 
code. So you've got the nuclear capsid, you've got the membrane protein, you've got the envelope protein, and here you've got the spike protein. Although this is not to scale, the actual code for the spike protein is a bit longer than, than these others. And then over at this end, you've got this thing which very helpfully is called open reading frame, which really just means um, we don't really know what to call it. It's sort of general stuff and we it's all lots of different things. And so we've called it something really vague so that um, it sort of covers everything. So don't worry too much about what the name means. But that's where all the things which do the core activity of the virus are contained in that section of the genetic code. And the reason I've showed you that is because I'm going to talk to you about the test for um, the SARS-CoV-2. So although the, techni the technical side of doing polymerase chain reaction, particularly to testing for viruses, is really very standard and very common now, of course, um, a year or so ago, we didn't really know anything about um, this new virus. And so we didn't have a test for it. And so um, the fact that we've actually managed to develop one so quickly is actually really quite an amazing feat of science. Um, and one of the things they've done, which is quite clever in these polymerase chain reaction tests, is that they've used, what they do is they take a sample from you, so you might have had one yourself, a, a nose and throat sample that gets sent off to the main, the main laboratory. The, there is a little bit of preparation, first of all, to make sure the virus kind of pops out and then use little genetic probes um, to try and find the genetic material of the virus if it happens to be there. And they use the probes at two different places. So what they do is they have the open reading frame and then one other place on the genetic code. And if you remember, the open reading frame is at one end and all the other little proteins are at the other end, which is really quite clever because you've got a very good chance of picking up the virus if it's there by trying to tag uh, at each end of the genetic code. And it works, it works quite nicely. It works very well. So my professional body, the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, produced this lovely animation. I love this animation. I just watch it for fun sometimes. How the sample is processed and how the PCR test works. And so I definitely recommend that. Um, if you're interested in how the PCR works. This is a machine to, which does processes lots of samples all in one go. This was taken at my local hospital in Brighton um, this time last year. So this was kind of at the very beginning of when we were starting testing. We're now doing a, a lot more tests at a much greater scale, in fact. But you can actually do a lot of tests all in one go. So I don't know whether you can quite see, but there's sort of four four sections in there, one, two, three, four, and each of those have got um, 96 well plates. So you can actually process a lot of samples all in all in one go. And you'll see it's inside a, an enclosed um, machine so that it's, um, it's efficient, but it's also safe. So once you've done the pre-processing, you put everything inside there and it sort of happens automatically, which is good. And that's how they've managed to do so much testing and in, in, um, so much so such fast time. And this is the other thing that you might be uh, aware of is the lateral flow test. I'm sure you've all done your lateral flow tests more probably more than once yourself. And you might well have seen what the actual test cassettes look like. But I thought you might be interested to know that that's testing for the nuclear capsid protein of the virus. And um, again, if you're interested, we have guide, we've produced um, guidance for the whole procedure of how to take tests and how, how to actually read the results on this um, leaflet through the Institute of Biomedical Science. So coming to vaccines, this is also something which is really, really amazing. So the, um, the, the record for getting a vaccine from having an idea to make a vaccine to getting something that's being safe to be used in sort of routine vaccination programs it was four years and that was for a mumps vaccine. So the fact that we've actually gone from not knowing anything about the virus at all to 
putting vaccine in people's arms live on breakfast television within less than 12 months is just a stunning, amazing feat of science and collaboration and cooperation and, and all those other things. It's just really amazing. And um, one of the things that happened was lots of people, lots of teams got together and thought, let's see if we can make a vaccine. And as you see there, I counted uh, last summer, there were at least 166 different vaccines in process, but a lot of them fell by the wayside. Either they didn't work or um, they ran out of funding or they couldn't do the clinical trials, all sorts of reasons why they, they fell away. And we now have seven which are being which are actually being used in max mass vaccination programs around the world. Um, and so that's really, really amazing. So the vaccines that we have um, that I that I know about are all but the ones at the bottom. So we'll talk about that the one at the bottom in a moment. But all of these three, all these three groups, what they're trying to do is they are trying to fool your body into making an immune response to the spike protein of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. They use they've all used slightly different technologies to do it, but they are all trying to do the same thing and they're all new technologies so um the the previous uh, presenter trudy was talking about um ebola and there is an ebola vaccine which used this the idea of putting the genetic code for a bit of the virus in a in a hot in a virus carrier so and that that had been used before, but only had only been licensed in December of 2019. So that's quite new. And these other two things, this messenger RNA vaccines in clinical in humans was not being used for anything, um, not for viruses anyway. And this, although this idea of putting the making the protein in insect cells was is quite a standard way of making proteins, it's not been used for a to make a vaccine before so all of it is new and exciting and and it's very safe everything's been very carefully done and very carefully regulated but from from me as a virologist it was really so exciting and i was just so excited when it was my turn to have my vaccine the sinovax which is one which was developed in china has been used in quite a lot of countries actually including uh, i definitely know turkey and probably some other places as well as just china itself and this found neighbor one which is in clinical trials now across europe they've used the more traditional approach of taking the whole virus but sort of pickling it so in some ways that's better because you give your you don't have to guess which bit of which bit of the virus the body wants to respond to you give it the virus and it does what it wants but um of course you can see how it you've got to grow up the whole virus and then you've got to make it safe to use in people and which is why it's taken a bit longer to to get there um but but we'll see how we'll see how that all goes so i want to just say that um i went to a state school i was the first person in my uh, family to go to university I am the only scientist. They all think I'm slightly weird. But I just love microbiology and I, I love viruses. So um, what what I'd say is um, if you're thinking about a career in science, just just kind of follow your interest, follow, follow whatever you're interested in and also take opportunities when they came along. One of the reasons why I've been asked to um, talk to you today is because people have heard of me and that is because in January of 2020, somebody from my professional body rang me up and said, you know, this new virus that's coming out of China that they that we've known about for about a month. They want someone to go and talk on the radio about that. Could you do that? And what I thought was, of course, I can't do that. I'm very quiet. I'm quite shy. And I, why does anyone want to, want to know what I've got to say about anything? But what I actually said was, uh, yes, OK, then. And I quickly went away and researched everything we knew about this new virus coming out of China, which luckily in January 2020 wasn't all that much. I put it together with what I do know about um, coronaviruses. And then I went onto the radio and talked about it. And I wasn't terrible. And I'm actually doing a lot of TV and radio. Now, I found my little niche in BBC local radio. I quite like talking about viruses. Um, on uh, to people in on local radio stations and i if i had said no i wouldn't know that 
that I was only good at that. And so I would definitely encourage all of you to just, as I said on the top of my side, just go for it. Um, because a career in science can be a really rewarding, but also, you know, you can really help people in unusual sort of, you know, unusual sort of ways. My contribution to the pandemic has been explaining how the virus works and how vaccine works to people on BBC local radio. I haven't developed a vaccine. I'm not even doing the testing, but I'm doing my bit. So um, that's my talk, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Really interesting, actually, to hear from you. Um, couple of questions. Uh, why is understanding the genetics of SARS-CoV-2 so important? It's because we um, we need to understand how it relates to um, other coronaviruses. So one of the things that we have been trying to do along the way is trying to find out where did this virus actually come from? How does it relate to other viruses? One of the things that we're doing um, very well in, in, in the UK is actually sequencing all these different variants. So if you understand about the genetic code, you can understand where the changes have come, so let's say in the spike protein and what that might be doing to um, how the virus works. And it's also important if we want to try and understand what treatments might work against it. Um, if you can, if you can, you can sometimes, particularly in virology now, we sometimes use the genetic sequence to predict whether a drug might work. I mean, obviously we haven't really got any drugs that work very well against the virus. We've got some things that work against the COVID disease when people are get seriously in a hospital. We haven't got any, any any antivirals, but the more we know about the genetic code, the more we can do with it. And, and so that's why we need to know. And just, just one more question. Are there antivirals in development and do you think they will work? Um, there are some in development, I gather. Um, whether they will work or not, we, we have to sort of hope that they might work. Um, I know that people had been working on antivirals against SARS-1 and also MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which is which is awful. You know, if you think things are bad with COVID, the um, chances of you dying from MERS is 34%, although it affects a smaller number of people, so we don't hear about it very much. So antivirals against coronaviruses has been something people have been working on for quite some time and haven't made all that much progress. But what I'm hoping is because um, it's a global pandemic, then more resources will go into it and perhaps more different people will have some more ideas and we might get somewhere with it. But it's very tricky. There aren't very many antivirals anyway. Um, when you think about how long it took to get antivirals against HIV, it was it was four or five years before we even had one and so you know it does take a bit of time unfortunately thank you very much sarah really appreciate you giving up your time to talk to us today thank you. fascinating fascinating presentation thank you thank very you. much